Adventists are a Bible-believing people that have their very foundation in Scripture. A statement that clearly, articulately sets forth the Seventh-day Adventist position on the sanctity of life in the context of abortion. Um, can you talk about some of the history of abortion in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Sure. Um, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, from our earliest years, Seventh-day Adventists have stood for the sanctity of life. We go back to our earliest history. Our name is Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day referring to the Sabbath. When we go look at the Sabbath, we look at creation, God creating all life, God forming life. So life is a gift of God. So from our earliest days, Seventh-day Adventists have respected the sanctity of life based in the creation motif, based in the very Sabbath theology and the heart of that theology is the respect for the sanctity of life. Early Adventists like James White, Uriah Smith later, uh, J. N. Andrews later spoke very forcefully for the sanctity of life and very openly against abortion. Seventh-day Adventists throughout our history have upheld the value of life and the desire to protect the unborn. history have upheld the value of life and the desire to protect the unborn. As time went on though, and the hospital system developed, our medical system developed, there were instances that were not the best, I can put it that way, in the Adventist church, where as Dr. Peter Landless said, and I was interested in Dr. Peter Landless's comments, he is the director of our medical department at the General Conference. And I took pretty extensive notes during annual council and Dr. Landless made a very profound statement. He says, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, we don't have a wonderful history when it comes to abortion. years that we did not, as Dr. Landless said, have a good history in the area of abortion. Were there abortions that took place in the Adventist church during those years that really could have been avoided? There were. And the church has to acknowledge that openly and simply say, what can we do today to protect the unborn? That's the value of this document. The guidelines that will de be developed from this document later by medical personnel and ethicists and scholars grow out of our biblical theology. So you do not establish guidelines and then say, what's our biblical theology? We start with the Bible and the Bible becomes the basis of faith and practice for Seventh-day Adventists. It is our basis of faith and practice on our doctrines. and It's a basis of our faith and practice in this statement on abortion. Bible-believing people. The guidelines that will de be developed from this document later by medical personnel and ethicists and scholars grow out of our biblical theology. So you do not establish guidelines and then say, what's our biblical theology? We start with the Bible 
and the Bible becomes the basis of faith and practice for Seventh-day Adventists. It is our basis of faith and practice on our doctrines, and it's the basis of our faith and practice in this statement on abortion. And sacred human life is the greatest value to God. There's nothing more important to God than human life. He created life, so it's important to him. Every child is not some kind of genetic accident. When the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of that child's personality, God was at work there. He's the author of life. The The document says, God considers the unborn child as human life. Another very vital statement. In other words, human life begins at conception. The unborn child, the child in the mother's womb, it's not when the child begins breathing that life comes. It's not when the child is born that life comes. It's when the child is conceived. The document quotes the commandment that says, thou shalt not kill. Now, Seventh-day Adventists have been known as a people, not only of the book, but as a commandment-keeping people. As Adventists, we believe in Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Here are they that have the faith of Jesus. It would be very difficult for us to talk to someone about the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, if indeed we didn't have a clear statement regarding the sanctity of life and not murdering the unborn in elective abortion in the mother's womb. And so here, the statement in point three points out that the statement, that the commandment in the Bible, thou shalt not kill, also applies to the unborn in the mother's womb. Now, during our discussions, a, the question of rape and incest came up on the floor at annual council. What about a woman that's been raped? What about incest? There are some very, very difficult, some very challenging issues that one has to pray through carefully. But I was very impressed with Dr. Arthur Stella, who was the chairman of the committee that on the statement on abortion. Dr. Stella's comment on that and his response was very, very telling. He said this, rape is an act of violence against a woman. One does not solve an act of violence against a woman, rape, with an act of violence against a baby, murder. And I thought that was a very perceptive, very telling statement. that one should not tamper with a woman's body, that uh, the child belongs to the, the woman. If you look at scripture, one of our Hebrew scholars in the studies of the document pointed out something that I really was not aware of in Psalm 139, verse 13. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I'll praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Now it's very interesting. The word formed in Psalm 139 has a Hebrew root and the Hebrew root has to do with ownership. So what God is really saying is, when, when David speaks, he said, you owned me when I was still in my mother's womb. So the ownership of the child is God's. God owns that little baby. We are stewards of the life that God gives. So when a mother and a father, husband and wife, 
have a child or when a woman gets pregnant out of wedlock, this little baby in her womb is owned by God. It's, it's God's child. He indeed is the owner of all life. And the Bible teaches care for the weak and the vulnerable. Throughout the Bible, the Bible talks about care for widows, care for the orphans, care for the poor, care for the disadvantaged, care for the marginalized, and that would certainly care, be care for the unborn. Who's going to speak up for those babies in a mother's womb? Who's going to speak up for the unborn child, the defenseless child that cannot defend themselves? This document does that. It outlines the fact that, that the church speaks to the value and the sacredness of life for the unborn. The sixth point is one that brought a lot of discussion, Matt. I think point number six was the most discussion, and I think the reason for that is it was misunderstood by many as opening a door for abortion um, as we define it in the document. times that there are life-threatening issues for that mother. There are times that there are very difficult, very painful decisions to be made. So there's a sentence that is put in the document that says, consequently, in rare, now notice the language, how carefully it is chosen, in rare and extreme cases, human conception may produce pregnancies with fatal prospects. Now notice these are fatal prospects and or acute life-threatening birth anomalies that present individuals and couples with exceptional dilemmas. Decisions in such cases may be left to the conscience of individuals involved in their families. These decisions should be well-informed and guided by the Holy Spirit and the biblical view of life outlined above. involved in their families. These decisions should be well informed and guided by the Holy Spirit and the biblical view of life outlined above. This statement does not open the door for abortion at whim or choice, but it points out compassion, that there are times when a woman's life is threatened. There are times when a baby is, is in a fatal condition. The goal is always to save life. The goal is always to preserve life. But this document does not presuppose in any way that physicians do not have the authority or the ability or the God-given right and mandate to make choices in very critical medical conditions. Neither does it take that choice away from a woman in that medical condition or her husband. The document is a document that outlines biblical principles, but in the final analysis, in life-threatening, as the document says, when there are fatal prospects and decisions have to be made, those have to be left to a biblically informed, spirit-guided conscience of that woman and of that doctor at that particular period of time.
that we want to be very sensitive and help people who've had an abortion to grow physically, emotionally, and spiritually. They may be hurting, and the church's role is to minister to them. The document ends with this statement. The issue of abortion presents enormous challenges, but it gives individuals in the church the opportunity to be what they aspire to be. The fellowship of brothers and sisters, the community of believers, the family of God, revealing the, his immeasurable and unfailing love. Matthew, to summarize the document, I can summarize it this way. The document is not a compromise document. It is a biblical document that makes a biblical statement on the sanctity and the preciousness of life. For one, I am thankful to be part of a church that values life, that values the lives of men and women, whatever their ethnic background, whatever their educational background, whatever their economic background, we link that rooted in creation. I'm thankful to be part of a church that values the unborn, those who can't speak for themselves and has a clear biblical view of the sanctity of life. But I'm also thankful to be part of a church that is not going to be condemnatory, that's not going to be judgmental, it's not going to use a document like this to oppress people, but rather, I'm thankful to be part of a church that reaches people where they are.